Okay, as I remember, we left off where we were going to study the mezuzah and the kippa at the least at the door deal. Uh, just have them shut the door when they come in. Uh, So we will start, I think, with the mezuzah. Um, it's not in here. Uh, something we will refer to that in a minute. I'll have to get you the page number. during the time of Yeshua. Okay. This, however, was. Uh, it had different forms, but it did have the form that we're going to talk about today. Um, you can find mezuzot, not the doorpost, but the object that we're about to talk about. You can find those in antiquity. Okay. So that is the reason that we in our home have adopted the mezuzah. And if we ever build a synagogue, there will be a mezuzah on every door. Okay. We'll have one on the gate of our property in case someone walks to synagogue, which will be ideal. Uh, so, and, and so I'm, I'm about to give you the reasons why uh, we are specifically commanded to write these words on the do doorposts of your house and upon your gates. If you come to my house, you'll see that my gates have mezuzot on them. We have a gate on the left side of our house that goes into our backyard. So it has a mezuzah on it. It's affixed just like the house, which we will talk about here in a minute. Uh, so today, when you hear the word mezuzah, most of the time you're talking about the object. And I'll try to take my time and draw it decently. I'll draw this one. And they look, they vary in shape, size, and appearance. Okay. They can be square, they can be roundish. <clears throat> and many of them, not all, but many of them have a sheen on it. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
So it's an object that's typically anywhere from two and a half inches to even four inches. I've seen some big honking ones. Okay. Um, <laughs> she made one of those. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't know why they're laughing at each other. <laughs> she took a rolling pin and stuck a whole scroll in <laughs> That would be cool. We will, we Cut a rolling pin in half, hollow it out. There you go. <laughs> that would be, yeah, we so, be the one on your gate. On your gate. Outside. That's a good idea. That is a cool, write that down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rolling pin hollowed out because it has a pin. Because it has a spindle through it. Yeah. So you could just break it apart. <laughs> Put a scroll. Stop and do that. <laughs> so it's an object, and on the back side, it is hollowed out. Okay? And so something goes in there because the command is to write these words. Uh, let's just go through. I have to get it in my head. I don't have it in front of me. Let me see if I can see it on this. Al mezuzot, yeah, uch tav tam al mezuzot betecha uvishe arecha. You shall write them on the doorpost. And the word there is actually carve them, okay, or inscribe them. All right. You shall write them on the doorpost. Mezuzot, plural of mezuzah. Mezuzah is the Hebrew way to say it. It's anglicized to mezuzah. Um, upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. So, it was in times past where the Shema you, was actually carved into the doorpost, literally written into the doorpost. Yeah, okay. But, uh, and that would not be wrong, however. <clears throat> uh, it's a lot of work, it's very expensive to have it done right and done nicely. That kind of thing, and if you move, so you can't take it with you. Rich. And a gentile wouldn't buy your house, right? <laughs> you know, because you can't take that out, and so you're you're kind of you could be financially stuck if you do that. And if you paint over it or something like that, have to replace the door frame, you're you're, you're in danger of far, far yeah, the weather defames it, you know. So because it has the name in it, and so that's the reason. There's multiple reasons why it's not done that way. Okay, so um, so the custom is, and if you look, if you went to the Beit Hamikdash, however, the temple in Jerusalem before it was torn down, the Shema was put on certain parts of the outer wall of the gate, near the gates, and it's actually inscribed in the stone. Um, I can't remember if they've actually found that, but I've seen renderings of it that might have been artist renderings or something like that. It's talked about, it's proven in history that it was there. Okay. So that's how you're confirming that, that it was there in Yeshua's time? Well, the, this version of it even goes back to Yeshua's time. Yes. How do we know that, though? What proof do you have of that? Finding these all over the ground in Israel. Okay, so artifacts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe it's written about. Um, it would be in later writings. I would have to. I, have, I, I did the research years ago. I don't have the sources in front of me. Um, but nonetheless, w what I'm getting at is physically writing it and affixing it to your house was well in practice. It was in practice at the Big Leap Dosh, and it was in practice in the time of Yeshua. What, how early this form came along is probably still up for debate and not very emphatically provable by historical methods, but the hints are there. But <coughs> for the reasons that we've already talked about, this is why it's changed into this form. And now, this will identify your house as a Jewish house. And so, even recently I read a story, I think it was in France, where a woman, a Jewish woman's neighbors came to her and asked her to take her mezuzah off for hers and their protection because of what went on, the shooting over there mm -hmm. in France. And she wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, it can, it, it you know, it's kind of very similar to the TTO. When you put them on, you just kind of stick out. You know, and when people come to your door and they see that, they're going to be, huh. <laughs> put that on. <laughs> I don't think we should put that on. I think a lot of people don't know what it is, but 
They won't know what it is, but they, but they will ask. But the Nazis knew what it was. That's how like, the Nazis happened. knew what it was, and a lot of people know what it is. On the footnote, on the footnote of that, though, Daniel, when you walk into a house and see that, you know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that situation where I've done a call, a house call, and walked up to the house and I saw it, and saw it there, and it, was, it just overjoyed me that I was yeah. coming to serve a brother. That's right. So it is an identifier, but there is a spiritual nature to this. And um, for me, one of the most powerful experiences with the mezuzah that I had was actually in Israel. Um, in Jerusalem, it's up there. There's one on every hotel room door. There's one on every door of all the bars you go to. They're just everywhere. I was sitting at a bar on, on Saturday night right after the sun went down. I was sitting out, there's a cafe, a street cafe that served liquor and food. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm watching the, the server, maitre d' or whatever he is, he was a senior guy on staff at this restaurant, running all over the map, getting tables, setting up tables for everybody. And because it's busy, I think I told you all on Saturday night, Jerusalem just explodes. It's a fun time. And he's just in and out, in and out. Every single time he went through that door, or came out that door, he honored him. Aww. Every single time. So, <clears throat> and for me, what it does for me personally is, you all know, you go out, you go into your life, you spend time out in the world, out in the corruption of the world, having to hear people, see people do wicked things, and experience wicked things yourself, just because you live in the world. And this is a way that has allowed me to actually, I say physically, but physically shed all that junk before I come in my house. Mm -hmm. So, and, it, and it's also a reminder to take him with you, because what does the Shema say? Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All right, what's next? And it shall be that these words shall be upon your heart, right? You shall talk about them when you lie down. When you rise up, when you go down the road, right? Marcus, I need you to, you're distracting me. Uh, when you go down the road, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you sit in your house, the whole thing. So it's the walking down the road. That's what you're doing when you're leaving your house, right? You're about to go walking. You're about to, when you walk on the way is literally what it says. And that, that's supposed to be an allusion to the Torah. Right? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to walk the Torah wherever you go. Mm -hmm. But in a practical sense, as soon as you leave your house, you're supposed to you're not supposed to leave the word behind you. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the lamp for your feet and tell you where to go, right? Right. And so and this is a reminder of that because you understand that inside this object is a scroll, and that scroll has very specific words on it, some of which we just quoted, and we're gonna read all together, all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh <clears throat> They're in your daily portion, in your daily prayers. Mm -hmm. everything, everything that is in the Mezuzah scroll is one prayer in your daily prayers. Mm -hmm. Tell me your name again. Um, Charlie. Charlie. A -B -E. Can you, um, could you also relate it um, to the time in um, back when they were in Egypt and there was a Passover? Absolutely. And they, they covered the doorpost Absolutely. with the blood so that we have the same word. future of Yeshua and his blood covered. I'm glad you brought that up because when you do look in Exodus 12 at the Passover, the mezuzot are brought up and you put the dam of the seh on the mezuzot. Okay, you put the blood of the lamb on the mezuzot. And it's also in there where he tells you, bind them upon your eyes, as frontless for your eyes, and on your hands. Right, which is part of the Shema, and I told you last week, I think, that part of the Shema, that's one of the reasons I believe that we don't actually 
due to filling in fulfillment of that command because it's more, in that sense, more of a spiritual thing because that portion of it was given before the Torah was actually written down. Remember that? You know, a bunch of rocks, do you remember? <laughs> okay, so, um, so that is a very legitimate point to bring up is that the blood was put on the mezuzot of the houses and so that brings up a spiritual, you have a door. Yeshua said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right? And so he wants to see a mezuzah there. Are you with me? He wants to see what's supposed to be on the doorpost of your house, which is the Shema. That's why as soon as that hit me, I memorized it. I wanted it inscribed here. Yeshua said in Mark 12, 20 something, I can't remember, but the, the Pharisee, one of the rich men or somebody came up to him and asked him, what is the greatest command? I think he was a young teacher. Yeah, he asked you a question. Speak. Privately? Yes, please. I didn't be blocked. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> Has he given us the verse that it's coming from? Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. 4 through 9. 4 through 9. I was out for that. Let's see here. Where was that? Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. See the mezuzah. Yeah, so Yeshua wants to see that mezuzah when he knocks on the door of your heart, right? Um, so that was why I memorized it. So that is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. And now we'll, we'll if you want to go to wherever it is, page someone's 105. fine. 25? Page 105. 105? We need the whole one, though. Yeah. In the daily prayers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Eloheinu, Ve'ahavta Ubachalim <laughs> <laughs> Ukshartan Lebot Al Yadeha Vehayun Totafot Benehecha Ukhtam Al Mezuzot Vekeha Vishareha. That's the Shema. That is the first part of what's written on the scroll. And the second part of what is written is, is also in your Sidur. It just continues. Except we interjected the Ahav Talera Echa Kamocha in that prayer, which is Leviticus something, which is where he says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> so um, I have written a few Mesozoic parchments for people, and I have put that one in there as well. Because that's the second great command, right? Because it, that's what I started to say is over in Mark. The teacher approached Yeshua and said, what is the greatest command? And the first words out of his mouth was not, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The first word out of his mouth was, Shema Yisrael. Yahweh Elohecha, Yahweh Echad. And then he said, so he's quoting Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. And it was already customary that 6 verse, verse 4 through 9 was the greatest command. So he didn't say the whole thing, but he didn't have to. He was among Jews. Right? So, uh, <clears throat> so he affirms that this is the greatest command. And this is another reason why we do not, I don't want to say allow, but we do not smile upon people saying the word Trinity in reference to him. Because that is in direct disobedience to the Shema. Mm -hmm. Yahweh. Yeah, is Echad. He is one. Okay? So, we covered that a few weeks ago in this class. If you need to see that 
It's a very good explanation of why we, and it came out brief and it's very powerful, I think. It's a good explanation of why we have come to that conclusion. There's stuff about it on our website. Um, it can be an issue for some people. It's always amazing to me how early we address that particular topic. It always comes up. Always. And okay. usually within so, the top 10. So the second part of that Shema, or what is, uh, it's another Shema. Uh, it's actually uh, starts the same way as the Shema, and it's in De Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is a redundant rendition of Shema. Im Shema Tishmeu. If you listen, listen. If you really, really listen, it's kind of what he's saying. It's in fact he repeats the word in two different forms. It's 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 the, the word Shema twice. Okay. If you hearken diligently to the commands that I command you today, I'm on page 105 at the top, to love Yahweh your Elohim and to serve Him with all your heart. So the rest of the scroll is right there on the top of that page, on page 105. That's the second part of the scroll that is in the mezuzah. Okay? Now, you can write your own if you are so inclined. It will take you a long time. It will take you more than one try, I promise. <laughs> Lower this a little bit. And I think, I can't remember in what context we did this, but we talked about this recently in some class that I taught. Are they starting to run together yet? <laughs> you don't know the next. <laughs> <laughs> Should have wrote smaller, but. If you do write one, this letter should be raised, and this letter should be raised larger. Okay? That's that's what you see when you look at a Torah scroll. This letter is enlarged, and this letter is enlarged. And that word together, those two letters together, form a word that equals two different words, depending on how it's used. So, uh, however, you can get what's called a kosher mezuzah scroll. That can be very expensive. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the thirty bucks. If they're written, what that means is that they are written by a rabbi and checked by a rabbi the, the same way they would check a Torah scroll, which is backwards. They read it backwards, letter by letter, to make sure that every letter is in there. Okay. Um, is that necessary? It's not. It's not necessary, but it's right here. You better make sure it's his word. That it's, everything is spelled right. Right? 
So that's why you probably would be better off maybe, even though if you're a sentimental person, a lot of sentimental people want one there of their own. I've, several people in the congregation have asked me to write their scrolls um, because they wanted something a little more special. I don't do a fantastic job, so if you're looking at perfection, you ain't, ain't going to look like one of those rabbis. I'm not a calligrapher. <laughs> I'm not a scribe. <laughs> we had one of our previous congregants start his learning of Hebrew with the Shema because instead of writing out the whole thing, they concentrate on each and every word and they repeat, repetitively wrote it until they knew how to write so that word. Nice and then when they got ready to, they wrote the whole thing out and that's what they put on their door. But that started their journey on learning Hebrew itself. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so the scroll is rolled up, put inside the, the device, which you can get at most Judaica shops, be they online or, or down in... Myerland or somewhere. Um, and so there is a ceremony that you go through to affix it. And uh, um, that's not in our Siddur, uh, but the blessing is a standard blessing, um, which is basically. That's the beginning of a lot of our blessings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Anything that he's commanded us to do when we are fulfilling that commandment in, in formality, that's what we say. And so the last two words are Likboa uh, Mezuzah. Something come? come? No, to affix. To affix? Uh, to hard to write on this wobbly board, you can't tell. Leak boa hamazusa. Okay. So you would take, if you bought the kit, if you bought a mezuzah that has the scroll with it, which is the easiest way to do it, um, you, you take that, you go to your door, your doorpost of your front door, typically that's where people start. You put the first one on your front door, the one door you use the most. And you're going to fix it on the right door frame. So you're inside the door frame, right? You turn to the right and you go about shoulder height. Now if you're if, if you're eight foot and your wife is four foot, you want you might want to shoot in the middle like Corey over here. <laughs> Everybody else will be jumping up and <laughs> 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 I don't know that I need to, it's just you're inside your door. It's gonna go on the right. Okay. Well, didn't that come from the Is mine well set? Yes. So it's it's. Some people think that. I don't know that that here. Not not here. Well, you're kind of tall. That would be tall. That would be high. But I'm talking about this part, yes. not on this part. Right on the inside of the door. Right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it leans inward. So your sheen is not going to be straight up and down. Mm -hmm. It goes in because it, that alludes to when you go out when you come in okay so you want it working in both directions if you, if you know what I'm saying so that's why it's diagonal if you, if you do a search on a mezuzah the first picture you will probably see of an affixed mezuzah will be diagonally fixed going into the house and typically about one-third of the way up in the door frame unless you have a ten-foot door frame you want it about shoulder height for sort of the mid, middle level height in the house. Adults, kids will be jumping up anyway. <laughs> it's good for them. So why is there a shin on it? Shin is, it alludes to this letter in the Shema, but it's also the first letter in Shaddai. El Shaddai. And it's a lion. The shin is a lion's teeth. So it's also seen as protection. Hmm. Is it the word of Elohim, our protector? Is it Yeshua, the lion of the tribe of Yudin? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's like, it, it has extra special meaning to us Messianics, because it's a picture of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so you, yeah, your sheen is going to be leaning in that way. In addition to Shema and Shalom. And, <laughs> and the list goes on. And the list goes on. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, 
it's customary to honor it when you go out, when you come in. And what most people do is touch the mezuzah, just like we do the Torah scroll here. By the way, a lot of mezuzot look like a Torah scroll wrapped up in its clothing. Ours does, and ours actually has a crown on it. Ours looks like a little Torah hanging there with a crown on it. And so... Where'd you find that one? Uh, Maureen did. Oh. Um, we had one a lot like it in New York, but it, it, our sun, our door takes full heat of the sun. And that one hung there for years and was worn out. I think she took pity on us and bought us another <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so we honor it at, when we go out, we honor it when we come in, and I've already kind of told you the effect of that. And I want to move to the keepa as well. So is it, do we have any lingering questions about the mezuzah? If you buy a kosher, will they take out the awam that are shown in there? No. They will spell it out. Because it's supposed to be what is in the Torah. I would check it if I were you, but I checked ours. Yeah. And? Huh? Greenfield Judaica has them. Most, like I said, most Judaica shops do. But they also have ones that are not kosher. Yeah, they have some modern day kind of reform freaky stuff, you know, and I don't I don't know if you actually get a kosher scroll with them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They they could be machine printed. Okay. Yeah. But is that fine? It's fine to me. Okay. It I mean kosher is rabbinic and so like I said, it would have been handwritten and checked backwards and made sure that all the letters were there. If you're comfortable with a machine printed Azusa scroll you might do the check, just make sure all the letters are there. Stick it on your house. And there's no difference between a Messianic Jewish one versus a... Not in my house. I see no reason to change. I'm sure there are Messianic Gentiles who like to diverge from Jewish things, who have done something different because they do a lot of that stuff. But not me, not us. That's not our mindset. Either. It's identical to what Orthodox Jews have. Does it have to be visible from outside? Because we have we always go through the back door, the garage, to the kitchen. I, would, I have one in my door from my garage to my house. But does it have to be from the front door, right? Well, it the front door? It, be on all doors. it should be on all doors. Yeah. Okay. It should be on all doors. Now, I, I, we're, Batillon doesn't have a police squad that's going to come to your house and make sure. <laughs> That's up to you, it's your house. That's up to that guy right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's next year. That's next year. Watch out when you buy more. Yeah. <laughs> Since you had brought up the old one on your door, uh, would. I'm sorry. Since you brought up the old one on your door, having to do something with that to replace it, uh, would you also, to dispose of it properly, bury it as you would an old Talit? We could, it's called hectish. Yeah, there is a way to dispose of sacred items. It yeah. should be buried, yes. Um, um, we gave our old mezuzah to Shelby. She wanted it. And so we transferred it to her. Okay. Wasn't there a tradition about the piercing the ear thing? Not to my knowledge. Oh, got that that's a slight thing that's, anyway. I think that's some of that Gentile messianic stuff, writing we things in through the year on the doorpost or something? Well, that, it does happen on the doorpost, yes. Yes, and I suppose there's probably a spiritual link to it, but it's not important for this class. Uh, How about bedroom doors? Yeah, sure. You want one? Okay. <laughs> Now, when you order them, I order mine online. You can, they're, you can get them pretty cheap, like as cheap as ten dollars. Obviously, like anything, you spend money. But when you buy them, as is a box, it's just a box. Then you, have, you usually they'll offer to buy the scroll separate. So well, I would come with. Oh, okay, so you just need to check. Mine yeah. Didn't you, have you it. Just, just make sure you check for that. Yeah. <laughs> if you get your mezuzah and there's no piece of paper in it, don't hang it yet. I've known someone who's done that. Yeah. And I was like, is there a scroll in there? <laughs> no. They didn't change it. They're not messianic anymore. I'm just saying. Mm. Their life is not very good right now. Mm. What's the point of having it without a Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was very telling to me when I went to, this was a, con a former congregate's house, someone of a leader. And when I found out, I was like, I didn't say anything because I'm not the police. I'm not here to tell you what to do. 
but I just registered it, how the response was when I said, is there a scroll in there? Because I couldn't see it. And that one, I knew that I should have been able to see it. Hey, it's okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. A couple of years later, they're gone. Part of that proved it was very cruel to me and my family. So, um, yes, there should be a scroll in it. As far as, uh, to, to Keith's point, what we did in our house is our front door has an elaborate mezuzah. Not to show off, but it's crowning the word of Elohim for our house. So we spent a little money. Uh, Maureen spent a little money when she gave us one. The rest of them are the ones that you can get for 10 bucks. You can buy kits of five for the rest of your doors. And that's what we did for all our other doors. The one on our gate used to be on our back door. So when we got the kit to put stuff on the, all the other doors, we moved that one out to our gate. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you say the blessing every time you fix it. Keep up. Ma, keep up. Ma. Nobody knows that word? Just keep up. What? What is a keep up? Ma can be used as how. Okay. It's what or how. <laughs> That's why I said just keep it. You said what keep it? Just keep it. What is a keep up? It's a head cover. Um, why do we wear them? So you notice that many of our men wear a kippa. Plural is kippot. Mm -hmm. Suppose since I've already set the precedent and put stuff on the board, I've got to do it here. So <laughs> <laughs> on that precedent, it's a real good. Kippah is a word that means cover, and it comes from the word, the root word of the word Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So it is a picture of atonement. It's the first reason I wear one. And you will find out that every custom in some way alludes to Messiah. Yeshua is our atonement, right? Why do Jews wear a kippah? Because since antiquity, going all the way back to Abraham, people in Israel wore a head cover. There's probably multiple practical reasons why they did that. It's hot over there. They might not want the sun beating down on their heads all day long. Okay? Uh, that might be a practical reason why they wore it. People over there today still all wear head covers, right? You look at the Bedouins, that's the closest picture you have to people of antiquity. They have not changed their culture in 4,000 years. They look very close to what ancient Jews would look like. And they all wear a head cover. Yeshua wore a head cover. We've already talked about the tallit. That also is a head cover, is it not? Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. um, there is a picture that's supposed to be, I haven't been, the British Museum doesn't, I think it's the British Museum of Natural History, it's a big one over there, and we couldn't go in it when we were in London, we didn't have time. I wanted to go in there because I wanted to see this picture. There's supposedly a, an ancient mosaic of Sennacherib, which is one of the Babylonian kings, and who had envoys that are specifically mentioned in Israel showing up to make petition to the king of, of that country, I think Assyria or Babylon, I can't I think Babylon, Sennacherib. And there, so there's a picture of the Jewish men standing before him with head covers on their head. That's 2,500 years ago, okay? So all Jewish men customarily wear a head cover. It is not commanded to wear a head cover, and again, Anti-Jewish, Messianic Gentiles, a lot of them won't wear a kippah. That's their business, but for them to say that it's a sin to do so, and a lot of them do, is ridiculous. Okay? 
Even back then, there were variations in style. People have always been interested in how they dress and how they look. Fashion is not new to the 20th century. <laughs> right? So they wore different styles of head covers. Okay? The one that Kelly wears and the one that Primary wears, <laughs> you'll figure that out, <laughs> are probably closer to what you would have found in ancient Israel than this. Okay? Kelly's is a lot like this, it's just larger and it stays on the head a little more easily. Um, but that doesn't make this one wrong. This is a, a sort of, the one I'm wearing today is sort of an ornate, but, but, thank you, but a customary. Okay? So what is the biblical basis for wearing a head cover? There's quite a few, and I, don't, I just don't have time because we ran a little long on the mezuzah. So I will just give you the episodes to look for in the scriptures, and then I will try to get you the scriptures if you can't find them. But a priest, a high priest, is commanded to wear a mitre. A mitre is a head, a head covering. It's a cloth hat. It looks a lot like what bakers and some bakeries wear today. It's like a little smokestack. Okay? And it, the, the high priest had that hat on and his crown was around it, in front of it. And so he had kadosh, la yawa, on that golden crown that was put upon his mitre, his hat. Okay? Every other priest wore a hat. It's called, a, in some translations, it's called a head tire, T-I-R-E. In some translations, it's called a mitre. In some translations, it's called a cover, a covering. Okay? It's a hat. It's a, it's a device for the head. Okay? Every priest wore one. And what did Yeshua say through Kepha, the Shaliyah? You are a kingdom of priests. Okay? So this is why your leadership here, and not all of them do it, but all of your pakidim wear a head cover. Okay? It was a personal decision for all of us. Keith, did I force you to put on a keeper? No, you didn't. You can ask Lance, your other pakid. I did not force him to put on a keeper. We had a pakid here who for a brief time, and I haven't told this story before, but for a brief time, he sided with the Gentile Messianic community and thought that he didn't need to wear one. And that's his decision. But I prayed a single prayer that morning. And I said, Abba, unity is critical for your house. And to me, this is a picture of disunity at the very core of your leadership. If I'm right, make him put it back on. The next week he had his keeper back on. It was one Shabbat. He went without it. And it told me a lot about and you, a lot of you know who I'm talking about and how it all went down. Uh, so, <clears throat> I do believe that it's an important thing in regard to acknowledging that He is your cover. Okay? Again, we're not going to police you. There are people who have been in this. Tim is part of the leadership. And to my knowledge, has never put on a keeper. Will is part of your leadership, and to my knowledge, has never put on a keeper. It is a personal decision, and you will not be frowned upon. I, you know, Keith and I and Lance, we appointed these men into the leadership, didn't even blink. That's not a criterion to become a leader, so don't put it on because you think you want to be a leader in this congregation and you need a keeper. <laughs> right? You should put it on if he is working it in you to put it on, right? Mm -hmm. And if he's not, that's between you and him, and that's wonderful. Just don't make it a bone of contention. Mm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so another scriptural reason that I wear it personally is because he says, I will crown you with a crown of life. And that's the reason for this design. This design, this version, is the most common among Jews. I am Jewish. So when I found out that I was Jewish... Jewish things suddenly got very interesting to me. And I wanted to identify. The first thing I did was go buy one of these. This, I've had this on my neck for about 20 years. I'm a 
again to be. We could talk about that next week. We're not going to have time to get to it this week. But as soon as I found out I was Jewish, I said, that's my people. And I always suspected it. You know that. I always suspected it. But when I found out, I was like, those are my brothers. You know? So I went and put that on. It took me a little while to get to the point where I would wear this, but I kept seeing head covers in Israel, especially among the priesthood. There's multiple places in Scripture. Let me see. I had some notes about it. Let me see if I can get to it fast. I don't want to burn too much time because we're already running out. There's multiple places in Scripture where you see people wearing a head cover. In 2 Samuel 15, David goes up to the Mount of Olives and he's wearing a head cover and he's praying. Okay? Uh, Jeremiah 14, in verses 3 and 4, it says that they cover their heads to pray. Okay? Um, I can't remember, I didn't write down the other scripture, but there's a place where you know where it is. It's in 1 Kings somewhere, I believe it's 1 Kings 19, if I'm not mistaken. But Eli, Eliyahu, when he hears the still, small voice, he's in a head cover when he prays. Okay? So, uh, and then there is... Uh, and there's there's a little write-up on our webpage about this. If you if you haven't found it yet, if you haven't read everything on our webpage, shame on you. <laughs> Unless you've only been here for two months, because it takes about that long to read it. Does <laughs> <laughs> our webpage address First Corinthians chapter eleven? Do what? Does our webpage address First Corinthians chapter eleven? No, it does not. It's a disgrace if a man prays with his head covered. No, and we, we'll, we'll talk about We've already covered that in this class. Who remembers? Thank you. Thank God. So <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 11 is talking about hair. Now, do you remember? He's talking about hair. A woman's head cover is her hair. A man is not supposed to have hair like a woman. Okay. First Corinthians 11. You clearly see if you read 1 through 14 and you pay particular attention to verses 2 and verses 14. Verses 2 and 14. So, uh, so that's not what we're talking about. That's a different issue. Um, Jews, I just gave you three scriptures where Jewish men were covering their hair, their head to pray. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just told you. If it's a sin for the priest, if it's a sin for us to wear a head cover when we pray, it's a sin for the priests to wear a head cover when they pray. Right? And isn't it interesting that they are not supposed to be in the big Hamikdash without a hat? Did you know that? The priests could not be in there without a head cover. Much like my Navy days. In the Navy, if you didn't wear a head cover, you were out of uniform and it was a violation. I've probably told this story before, but someone stole my hat one day and hid it from me. It was a joke. I was brand new to the boat. And I walk into a room full of people, about not quite as many as this, probably about 12 people in the room, and they were all A-gangers. And on, on the submarine, the A-gangers signed about two-thirds of your qual card, maybe a little more. Everything we're submariners. <laughs> Everything on the boat belongs to them, so you have to go to these guys to get your qual card signed so that you can get your dolphins. Okay? One of them, and I knew who it was, I kind of just suspected it, and he was the leader, been on the boat for eight years. Took my hat. I couldn't get off the boat. It's four o'clock. It's time for me to go. I was livid. Because <laughs> I couldn't leave. Because you can't go off. You can't you cannot be off the boat without your cover on. So if it's that important to the military and God said, do not come into the house without your head cover on to the priesthood, it, to me it's a pretty important thing. So the keeper, when I, and you talked about different sizes and everything, but I see the Orthodox also when they have the blue hat. Yeah. That would be the same thing, right? That's what, they're fun that's what that hat is functioning for. And what happened is, is in, just like with the Talit, in the Middle Ages, clothing changed drastically, especially for the Jews who moved to Europe. The ones in Israel still, it took a long time for their clothing to change because the Middle East was slow in doing so. But in Europe, clothing... As soon as the Dark Ages were over and people began to move to the cities and prosper, their clothing got elaborate. And, yeah, and the Jewish community had several different versions. Ashkenazi. I'm Ashkenazi. That's why I wear this. Okay? Russian Orthodox Jews wear the big black hat. 
the Chabad Jews wear a, a smaller black hat. Um, I mean, if you go to Israel today, Russian Orthodox Jews still dress in 1500, circa 1500 clothing where they wear the knickers and the, the broad shouldered coats that look like a woman's dress hanging off of them. And it comes down to here, and they got the knickers on and the high socks. In the middle of summer, they're wearing that stuff. <laughs> I'm like, dude, put some shorts on. It's fine. Interesting. But they associated their dress with their righteousness. That's not what we're doing. All we're doing is honoring. And, 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 and another thing, it's very similar to the TTO in the sense that you know it's here mm -hmm. and it, it is a constant for me it is a constant reminder that I belong to him he's my crown, he's my cover he's my atonement mm -hmm. and so it's, I believe that's what it's for now in some communities in some Jewish communities including Messianic synagogues it has become so important that it is it has force of law if you will, it's a custom and everybody knows that uh, Judaism knows that the head cover is a custom, but it's a strong one, and it has a lot of meaning. What we're talking about is we're kind of wrapping up our custom with the command to wear one as a priest. Are you seeing that? Mm -hmm. It's just symbolic, however. So if, if Keith forgets his keeper, if I forget my keeper, if someone runs in and steals ours as a joke, I'm not going to get as upset as I did 25, 30 years ago. I mean, I'm a grown man now. <laughs> I have matured. Because <laughs> uh, I threatened to break his neck. Just to let you know. uh, <laughs> but there's no judgment if you don't, if you're not wearing one. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. But likewise, if someone comes into this congregation and gets angry because we do wear them, you all need to know what our position is on this. There should be no judgment either way, right? Hallelujah. All right, we're done. Here we go.